I started this YouTube channel oh, a month or two ago uh, because I had in mind that I was going to show how to build uh, solid state dual resonant Tesla coils, the so called musical Tesla coils. In fact, I have two of those things that I built myself. Um, this is one right here. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is go through the construction process by actually rebuilding this. I'm going to tear this thing down to its components. And I'm going to rebuild it. And I'm going to start with the, uh, the base. The base of this, let me move you down. So there's a wooden base that I built originally uh, out of scrap wood. Uh, what I'm going to do is use this. Uh, number 15 fast tech aluminum extrusion I'm going to build a nice bottom base and there's a number of reasons why an aluminum extruded base would be nice in terms of grounding I'm probably going to wind up rewiring the whole thing I'll go through piece by piece and explain what each piece does uh, and uh, hopefully you'll find that somewhat instructive now here's the thing these Tesla coils are uh, complex systems uh, they're high voltage systems and everywhere you go somebody's going to say be careful you can kill yourself uh, because you're dealing with voltages in excess of uh, 15,000 volts in some cases in the case of a, a, a dual resonant uh, Tesla coil voltages aren't going to be quite as high they may only be four or five hundred volts but the currents are going to uh, be up there around a couple thousand amps so you can certainly turn your turn your fingers your internal organs to potato chips uh, in a blink of an eye, uh, if you touch the wrong thing at the wrong time while building one of these. Now, here's the, so that's the frightening news. The good news is I've been messing around with these things or building these as a hobby for about oh, five, six years now. And uh, I've been trying to be an active part of the Tesla coil community online. I've not heard of anyone killing themselves. Now, either that's because we're all just careful enough because these things scare the living bejesus out of all of us. Or it could just be that uh, they're a little less dangerous than we think. Uh, but in any case, if you put me near 15,000 volts, I'm an electrical engineer by training. You put near me near 15,000 volts of, of with any current, and I'm gonna I'm gonna watch out. So the bottom line in all this stuff is buyer beware, uh, builder beware, maker beware. Um, you're dealing with things that under normal circumstances are far out of your reach. But uh, the beauty of it is uh, you're free to build it at home. Now, here's the uh, other thing about the Tesla coil. It's a finely tuned instrument that's dealing with voltages and currents uh, that are way up there. You gotta, to make a Tesla coil work correctly, you have to tune it. And what I mean by that is just like a guitar, just like a musical instrument, it needs to be tuned to work. It's very rare that you're gonna just slap together pieces that look like this you know, you, you can coil wire around some, you know, a paper towel holder. You might find a toroid or you might find something that's like a, uh, you know, a ball of aluminum foil. You may use the same kind of copper tubing for the primary. Uh, but the truth is you're going to be very disappointed. You may get all the pieces together and things hum and make a loud noise, but you don't get any sparks. You won't get any sparks unless you tune it. And I'll explain the whole tuning process as well. And... Uh, with a, uh, the, there are a variety of Tesla coil designs. Um, the dual resonant musical, so called musical Tesla coil, it doesn't have to be musical by the way, it can just make sparks without music, is probably the most complicated of all the different designs. Uh, it's complicated because you need to know something about solid state electronics, you need to know high voltage, you need to be able to deal with multiple parallel signal paths at once. Uh, there's a high voltage path that uh, runs the, that actually uh, is what, what generates a spark. There's a control path that's in parallel that actually modulates the signal. Um, and then there may be another voltage path that just runs fans and things like that. So you've got a quite complex system with digital logic circuits. Um, in some cases, in order to make the music, we actually use little Arduino microprocessors. Uh, uh, hopefully in future videos, I'll explain all of that too. Um, all this goes to say that it's a, it's a complicated system. And in order to do anything satisfying, you gotta get all the pieces right, and it doesn't work until they're all just right. So uh, building one of these things is an exercise in debugging. 
There are a couple of places out there that make kits. Uh, a couple of sources, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put down the uh, web sources that I know of that will help you with information. There's a, there's a wealth of information out there, a wealth of people waiting to help you. And uh, there's also some commercial uh, ventures out there that will sell you kits. Now again, the danger is, it's not a danger, it's just you buy or beware. You can go buy a kit uh, from a very reputable company, uh, Eastern Voltage Research, Dan McCauley. Uh, does uh, does kits and they're they're um, I've, I've bought many of them and they work just great but it's not as simple as soldering some wires onto a board or parts onto a board and flipping it on uh, it's a little more complex than that and typically just like any electronic project when you first start it up nothing happens and you got to be able to debug both the high voltage and the low voltage sides of things so all this is a way to say uh, Tesla coils are very complicated uh, they can be dangerous um, and now I'm done talking about the danger. We'll just talk about the fun part. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw some equations on the board. I'm going to talk math. I'm going to say a lot of words. I'm going to try to say it quickly. And um, you can find the definitions to many of the things I'm talking about online. Uh, I, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave me a comment in the comments se section. Um, send me a note. I'm happy to answer. But the things I'm talking about are standard electronics. You can find them out anywhere. But it's important to understand ex what's going on here with the Tesla coil. Now I'll say one other thing again before we start. Uh, Tesla coils are the subject of um, a lot of uh, speculative fiction, let's say. And there are those who believe that Tesla was trying to create a uh, energy generation device or, or, or zero-point energy or uh, most guys who are building Tesla coil, myself included, uh, don't buy any of that. We build these things because they are uh, they're a precision high voltage instrument and when they work right they are just about as cool as you can imagine. And that's why we build them. Uh, I've actually been working on my coils in my driveway and I've had um, people walk up to me as they're walking by the house. We live in a high traffic area up here on the side of a hill and they'll come up and they'll ask me about uh, generating energy from the air or zero point or quantum blah 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 blah. I will humor them because I want to get them out of my driveway uh, but the truth is I, I, I don't I have not seen any evidence any science any math anywhere that suggests that you can make energy from nothing using anything available to us in this universe right now uh, who knows? Maybe someday they'll discover something. But right now, there's no such thing as perpetual motion machines. I do not believe in them. I don't you think you can make energy from nothing with these coils. Okay, let's get that out of the way. Uh, so uh, now I'll get into exactly what we're talking about here with the Tesla coil. This, there, there are uh, three, in my mind, and the progression that I use to build the Tesla coil, there are three types of coils that you can build. And I will... Uh, starting from the simplest to the most complicated. The simplest is a static spark gap Tesla coil. And what that means is that um, you've got uh, two LC circuits and you are uh, basically generating the pulses that go into the first, uh, the primary of the circuit with a, uh, a gap in a wire that is uh, exposed to high voltage. And what happens is when the voltage increases across the gap, and I'll, I'll show you all this, but you listen to the words first. When, when you expose a high voltage across the gap, the air between the gap, because we are in, on Earth and you know at one atmosphere, 14 pounds per square inch, the, the air eventually will ionize in that gap if the voltage is high enough. The air will ionize, you need, uh, it's believed, 30,000 kilovolts per, per centimeter. So if you want to make a spark jump across a gap of one centimeter, you need two wires and the potential across that wire have to be 15,000 volts. Now, typically on many spark gap Tesla coils, we use a, uh, a neon sign transformer for the for the primary voltage. Those things come in 15 uh, kilovolt or 12 kilovolt sizes. So we're looking at about half that. So typically the gaps that we're going to use are going to be uh, half a half a centimeter or less. And let me get an example of a, a neon sign transformer to show you. Okay, this thing's a bit heavy, but I want to show you here. So this is a neon sign transformer I bought from, can you see, Information Unlimited. 
Um, the important thing about these transformers is most of the unsane transformers have a GFCI breaker in them. Uh, they're made for signs and they're made to be safe. So if uh, for some reason the, the terminals get shorted, which could be because a human is shorting the terminals, um, the current will be shut off. If you try to make a Tesla coil with a uh, transformer that's got a GFCI in it, the GFCI is going to trip, there's going to be no voltage, and it won't work because you are indeed, after a fashion, shorting the terminals of the, of the, uh, the transformer. So if we just uh, look here, so what I've got is the input are right here. Oh, that's the ground. The input is here. Oops. Yeah, this is going to be some show. I'll put it up on my shoulder. Here. So we've got input here and here. So 110 volts, 112 volts for in the U.S. goes across that. There's a ground clip right back here. And then there's one high voltage terminal on that side, one high voltage terminal on that side. You put in 120 volts here, you get 15,000 volts out at uh, 60 milliamps. Doesn't sound like much, 60 milliamps, but at 100 and at 15,000 volts, that's basically 900 volt amps. You tend to measure power uh, in volt amps, and uh, that's enough to make a nice little coil. Now you can put these things in series. You can get 100. You know, 260s will give you 120. 460s will give you 240. Um, the more the current on a static gap coil, the larger the sparks. You don't increase the voltage to increase the sparks, you increase the uh, current. So uh, let me put this down and I'll continue on. Okay, so what I've got over here is a schematic of a, of a, a static spark gap Tesla coil. The high voltage power supply is here, you got the output the high voltage output, you got 120 coming in, but 15,000 volts coming out. One side goes to the ground, so the one side of the, we'll call this a coil here, this is the primary coil with an inductance L, it's in series with a capacitor C, and then you'll see there's a spark gap here. Um, this here, so let's see if we can sort of show here. So I have two little brass balls on a uh, quarter by 20 screw and you can screw this into something and you can imagine that basically what you do is you hold those about yay far apart and as the voltage increases and gets to um, you know 15,000 volts if you put these close enough a spark will jump and when the spark jumps across here this circuit is basically complete um, current flows between the capacitor and the inductor and it creates a magnetic field in this inductor which couples to this one over here with a coupling coefficient m and i'm saying a lot of different uh, things that may be confusing you but let's let me just say the words now and i'll explain this in a moment but at any any moment but at any rate this little these little dots represent this there's an inductor uh, going across uh, which is in, in the series circuit with the with the high voltage we'll call this the primary there is coupling, magnetic coupling, between the magnetic field that's created in this inductor with this one over here, and this is the secondary. And the voltage goes across there and uh, inevitably creates a current in here which generates sparks. Um, again, I'm going to have to explain all of that, in a, but I, what I wanted to give you is the idea that this is a very simple circuit. There's just a high voltage power supply a gap, which looks like that, just a wire connected to each of these little brass balls, spark jumps across, current flows. When the current flows, it actually sloshes back and forth according to a mathematical equation, which is this one over here, which is uh, this one over here, which you can't see, but you can now, which is that the resonant frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi to the square root of L times C. Again, said that really fast, I'll get into it in a moment. And that makes a Tesla coil. Now, if you want to build one of these from scratch, how would you do it? 
uh, because the values of these L's and C's have to be uh, precisely calculated in order to get anything useful to happen at all. And uh, it turns out there's a lot of help in this area. And uh, there is a program that you can get to on the internet. And uh, it is called Java TC, written by a friend of mine, uh, Bart Anderson. And as it turns out, there have been a lot of work, there has been a lot of work in modeling Tesla coils. And by modeling, I mean people have come up with mathematical models of this stuff. And uh, with the mathematical model, you can, once you've got a math model, you can, let me get my head out of the way, once you've got a math model, you can write a program to, uh, to do the math for you. The hardest part is coming up with a model. Uh, BART has created a program online in Java, so it runs in any web browser you want. Uh, just Google Java TC, and up will come a, a, a dialogue with a number of uh, blank spots for you to enter in various parameters, and it'll tell you exactly what frequencies your coil is resonant at, what size it should be, how you can get the coupling correctly, and all that. And uh, I'd say that until you run Java TC, you're not going to get your coil to work. Uh, or if you do, you'll just be pretty lucky. Um, at any rate, I've also put up there some other really good resources uh, for HV, and it is the number 4, hv.org is a website. Uh, those guys talk Tesla coils, they talk uh, 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 different power, you know, uh, 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 any kind of high voltage effects. Uh, they tend to talk about there. There's a whole Tesla coil uh, community that meets there regularly, international Tesla coil community, and uh, you'll find a lot of, uh, of people very willing to help you along if you want to build a coil out there. TeslaUniverse.com is a place where I've hung out. Uh, there's a, a excellent uh, uh, group there that as well. Very, very helpful group. If you look in their backlog, you can find all kinds of information about, uh, you know, uh, why things go wrong, when they go wrong, how to fix them. Uh, Richie Burnett is uh, just an uh, uh, engineering genius who's put one of the most clear and self-explanatory uh, uh, explanatory Tesla coil websites up. Uh, I highly recommend looking at his stuff. Uh, as well, and there are many, 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 many others. I've I've not gone into it uh, in in as much depth as I could, but you can Google it and find resources all over the, and um, and uh, and build a coil of your own design. Now, you may want to say, hey, what would be great is if I could actually get somebody else's design, and um, and put a coil together using uh, using something that somebody else has already done. And yeah, I agree. That would be great. Uh, and there are some folks who have published, you know, sizes. You know, the the size of the coil. When we look at the, something that looks like that like, looks like mine, like right here, everything counts. The sizes of the the sizes of these things, the geometry of this toroid, is important to the design of the uh, of the coil itself. It's important to tuning the resonant frequency between the secondary and the and uh, and the uh, the top hat here. The number of turns, so we look down here, we see the primary, so this is the primary coil here. The number of turns in here is important because this has got to be resonant, um, create a, it creates a resonant circuit with capacitors that are underneath here, I'll show you as well in a moment. This thing here is called a spark, uh, it's called a strike ring, it actually does, it's just safety feature and I'll explain that as well. Um, but the main thing to know is that there's math for everything. Now, you can uh, get lucky and you can do seat of the pants kind of uh, calculations. You don't have, you don't need computers. You don't need uh, 12 digits of precision. You just need to pay attention and you can get these things to work. Uh, so uh, whether or not there is a design out there you can use uh, it doesn't really matter because even if there was, you'd still have to get it to work. And tuning these things is very much like tuning a guitar. Somebody can tune their guitar, hand it to you, temperature changes in the room, the guitar is out of tune. You better know how to retune it yourself or you're going to play music out of tune. And it is very much like a musical instrument. And they are very, very touchy. So uh, I'll leave it at that and then I'll, all right, next I'll explain the different pieces of the coil. Uh, themselves. Alright, now let me try to explain the pieces of a Tesla coil. Um, 
I try to do this staying away from as much of the electronic jargon as I can, but this is an electronic circuit and um, it's almost impossible to stay away from the physics and the electronics. The thing that you need to know though, is you, you do not need a degree in electrical engineering to understand this. You don't need any degrees to understand this. Uh, grammar school kids put these together, high school kids put these things together. Um, there's no need uh, for advanced math or calculus, although if you are good at calculus, you can do some, you know, some pretty interesting things as well. And uh, it, it helps you understand what's, what's happening fundamentally, but you don't need any of that. Uh, but you do need algebra, and you do need a little bit of math. You need to know how to add numbers and find the hidden variable, or, or not the hidden variable, but solve for x in an equation. Now, the good thing is there are computer programs that will help you do that. But uh, if you don't know what to look for, you're going to be shooting in the dark. All right. So let me explain to the best of my ability what you got here. So Tesla coil is two tuned LC circuits that are coupled by magnetism. Uh, in fact, a Tesla coil is a, a air core transformer. Most transformers that you have in your machinery at home or whatnot are iron core transformers. Uh, let me get one of those, I'll show it to you. All right, this is an uh, uh, iron core transformer. You've got a bunch of windings wrapped around uh, a core which is made of uh, actually uh, metal plates that are shaped. Some are shaped like E's and some are shaped like I's and they're laminated on top of each other to reduce eddy currents. Um, I won't get into what those are, but what you need to know here with a typical transformer, there are connections for the secondary and there are connections to the primary. What's the primary? Primary is the, uh, is the input to the transformer. Now the reason you use transformers is to isolate circuits uh, uh, from, a, from a current perspective. So what's happening is you can have two circuits that don't have wires between them but that are coupled by magnetism and there's a lot of good reasons for that and uh, when you have that kind of isolation you can prevent noise problems or power problems if you're in a music studio you use transformers like this to stop hum and things like that and you're getting into your into your uh, into your audio output but you have a primary circuit coming in and a secondary circuit coming out the primary circuit is connected to uh, these loops of wire that go through the core and the secondary circuit also has loops of wire going through the core. Now there may be different numbers of turns of loops of wire and the beauty of that is that the voltage out and the voltage in can be different depending on the number of turns. In fact there is a there is math uh, and if you have one turn coming in on the primary circuit and the current is going around one loop and then coming out. And then on the secondary circuit, you have wires wrapped around the first circuit. And you notice the wires are all wrapped around each other. The primary wires and the secondary wires are all wrapped around each other. So you have one turn coming in, two turns coming out. Um, the voltage on the output will be twice what it is on the input. But it's not something from nothing. Just because the voltage is increased doesn't mean you get something. What happens is the current is decreased by a half. So if you have 10 turns on your primary circuit and 20 turns on your secondary circuit, uh, the voltage that you get on your secondary is going to be twice what it is on your primary, but the current's going to be half. So that basically power in is equal to power out. Now, as it turns out, there are losses and whatnot, so you actually get less power out than you put in, and that's the way things work in the world we live in in general. So you don't make something for nothing. But you can step up a step-up transformer called step up, will step up the voltage according to the number of turns. Uh, the Tesla coil is a massively stepped up transformer. There are a number of turns on the primary here. Let me bring you down. And if we can zoom in, there is my, whoops. Okay, what you see here are some terms of turns of uh, refrigeration coil. This is uh, the primary of this transformer, these turns. So current is going to flow around the outside of these, uh, these uh, tubes. This is a quarter inch, just regular old quarter inch refrigeration pipe you can get at uh, Home Depot. And it creates a magnetic field which couples into this thing here. These are, this is called a secondary. And as you can see there on this secondary, I believe there are about 1400 turns. 
and I can get into how I made this. In a future video, I'll show you how I made this. This is uh, uh, 1,400 turns of 24 gauge wire wrapped around a uh, uh, a, a PVC plenum um, that I covered, and then I covered the whole mess with Envirotex to protect it. So, in any case, you have you know one, two, three, four, five turns here, and 1,400 turns here. The voltage that you get in the in the secondary coil here is going to be five, or rather 1,400. The number 1,400 divided by five increased. So, if I've got Let's say I've got 15,000 volts here. Now, I don't on this particular coil, but let's say I did. Or make it easier, 10,000 volts here. So if I had 10,000 volts coming in here, um, and I have 1,400 terms here, uh, let's see, 5 over 1,400 is uh, 2, 8, 280. So it's a, it's a, one to, it's a 280 step up. So if I had 10,000 volts coming in, I would have 280 times 10,000 volts here on uh, forming on this on these wires here, so the voltage has stepped up dramatically, um, and the, but the current is going to be reduced by 280 times. So if I only had 90 amps coming in here, I'm going to have 90 over 280 amps in here. So much less. It won't be amps. It'll be milliamps. So I'm going to get some kind of uh, you know fractions of a milliamp in here, which is good because it won't electrocute. Now we'll get into frequency and whatnot in a moment. But the thing to show here is that this transformer, there's no metal here. See in this transformer. There's a, a core, an iron core, uh, and the coupling is, uh, is fairly high. The coupling between this coil, which is making a magnetic field, and this coil, which is picking up the magnetic field, that coupling is actually pretty low. And as it turns out, for a Tesla coil, you'll want it to be pretty low. Uh, if you make it too high, bad things happen. And we can get around, we'll get around to that also in a later video. But uh, just to show you, again, the Tesla coil, this is a transformer. This is the primary circuit. This is the secondary circuit. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to this circuit in this equation. Mentioned that we've got a high voltage source, which in my case, in the case of a static gap Tesla coil, could be something like a power, uh, the outside transformer. It's creating about 15,000 volts. AC, by the way, so this is 15,000 volts, K means 1,000, and when the voltage increases to the point where the air breaks down in that gap, a spark forms. When a spark forms, the current flows, and you have current flowing through that primary coil, which in my case here is a, are the, um, the terms of uh, refrigeration, uh, refrigeration uh, uh, tubing. And that creates a magnetic field because it's a coil. It creates a magnetic field according to Maxwell's equations. We'll get into that. That magnetic field is felt by the secondary, the tall, skinny thing with lots and lots of wires in it. That's felt, and the voltage is increased according to the ratio of the number of turns in the, between the primary and the secondary. Okay, that's all fine and good. Now, the magic of the Tesla coil is resonance. What's resonance? Well, resonance is everywhere. Resonance is, um, is basically, I, I think the best way to imagine resonance is if you walk up to a bell and you strike a bell with a hammer. You walk up to a bell and you strike a bell with a hammer. Bing! The sound you hear is the bell vibrating in air and it is vibrating at its natural frequency. Uh, natural frequency, as far as we're concerned, will be the same as resonant frequency. So the thing is, the bell is vibrating at the frequency that it wants to vibrate at, given its geometry and its composition and its weight in air and all that stuff. As it turns out, if you were to continue to vibrate that bell and strike it at the right time, uh, in order, you could actually increase those vibrations, make the bell louder and louder and louder and louder, not just by hitting it harder, but by hitting it in time with the vibrations it's creating. And the example people look, look at it all the time is a, is a kid on a swing at a park. So a kid gets on a swing at a park, or an adult, or you, you get on a swing at a park, somebody pushes you. If they push you, and you'll go out and you'll come back to them, They'll push you again when you come at, back to them. Basically, they're, they're 
adding energy to your swing, wing, to your swing, your swing makes an energetic system. They're adding energy to the system in time with the swinging, and you'll notice you go higher and higher and higher. And that's resonance because they are adding an energy at the resonant frequency of the system. The resonant frequency is how long it takes you to swing back and forth. And if you keep adding energy by pushing the swing exactly in time, you go higher and higher and higher. Now, as it turns out on the swing, certain things stop you. The, you know, your weight stops you. People can't push that high. Um, you know, inevitably you fall off or, you know, so you won't, you're in no danger of increasing your speed till you wrap around the, the swing set. Uh, but in an electrical circuit, there there may be there are ways uh, there are ways to create that dampening effect. The dampening effect is the effect that slows down the resonance. Um, you put resistors in the circuit and whatnot. But but in a Tesla coil, basically um, the dampening is is kind of low. It's pretty low. So that as you're hitting, the the objective is to hit the ringing electronic circuit, and it, it is kind of ringing, it is ringing, uh, in time with its, with, its own, with its own natural frequency. So what you do is you keep applying pulses to the input of the circuit in time with its swinging. Now this is all happening at thousands and thousands of times per second. The so-called F0 uh, is the frequency at which you need to hit the thing to build up to build up the uh, the charge uh, or, uh, on the on the Tesla coil, uh, and F zero is followed by this equation: one over two pi times the one over two pi times the square root of L in Henry's, which is, and C in farads. Okay, so again, what we're trying to do with the Tesla coil is we have a primary circuit. When in a static gap coil, when the voltage arcs, current flows, and it'll start vibrating, just like a bell vibrates. It's just when the when the when the spark jumps across the gap, it's like a hammer hitting a bell. The current sloshes back and forth at a certain frequency that's given by this equation, and then as it builds up, and it will start increasing, 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 and as it builds up, it couples magnetically to the secondary, the voltage is increased greatly and you get sparks break out out of the top of the Tesla coil because the voltage increases so much the air ionizes around the coil itself and you can form electric arcs to the earth. In fact, what you're doing is you can form electric arcs to ground, to, to other things that are grounded, uh, just like a lightning bolt. Uh, so the primary circuit here is grounded through a wire the secondary circuit, half of it's grounded through a wire, but the current comes out the top and then connects to the earth, to the atmosphere itself, and that's where the sparks come from. Okay, a lot said there. One more piece you should know. Okay, one other thing you need to know. So a Tesla coil is two tuned LC circuits that are, that are connected through a magnetic field, uh, just like a transformer. It's a transformer. Now, LC circuits, LC. L stands for inductance. I don't know why, there's probably some Latin reason for that, but that's what it is. L stands for inductance, C stands for capacitance. An inductor is a coil of wire, uh, typically a coil. And uh, whenever you coil a wire up and you put electricity through it, you get a magnetic field. Inductors store energy in magnetic fields. A capacitor is typically two plates that are, you know, close together, they put something in the middle, and if you put electricity on, on those, it will create a, the electric field is created, and it can store that electric electricity in terms of electric field. So a magnetic field, you know what it is, you get two magnets, you try to, you know, they'll either attract each other or they'll push each other apart. Electric field is like when you rub your feet on a carpet and you go to touch something and get a spark. Okay, now, the the resistance, the um, the resistance to a current, the the amount of of energy or the amount of current uh, that will circulate through the circuit, the amount of voltage across some of these things, will vary according to frequency. This is not true of other 
electronic devices, like a resistor. You can put any frequency you want across a piece of carbon resistor and the resistance of it. In a resistor, you can think of as a, a valve on a, uh, on a faucet. You turn the valve down, you reduce the uh, overall flow of water, open the valve, you let the water through. So an open valve is like a low resistance, and a, and a closed valve or partially closed valve is a very high resistance. It doesn't matter what frequency you hit that resistance with. What comes out the other side is only a measure, it's only dictated by the, the amount of closure of the valve itself. That's the value of the resistor. This is not true with inductors and capacitors. Their values change with frequency. Uh, it turns out, uh, if you can think of it this way, electric fields uh, in a capacitor, I like to think of electric fields, you know, again, you rub your feet on the carpet, you try to touch these spark jumps, they're kind of light and fluffy and airy, they're everywhere. Um, they are, they pass high frequency and they tend to block low frequency. In fact, a, a, a true capacitor is an open circuit to DC. You try to put DC across it, you get nothing. Current will not flow. But it is a short circuit to very high frequencies. So if you put a high frequency source across a capacitor, it's just like, you, you know, depending on the value of the capacitor, it could be just like a short circuit. The opposite is true with an inductor. Storing an energy in a magnetic field is like molasses. I mean, it's, it's thick. It's, you know, and again, this is just uh, an analogy. This is the way I thought about it going through school. But if you put DC, non-changing voltage across an inductor, it's like a short circuit. It just, just goes. But as soon as you start trying to change the voltage or trying to change the current, that magnetic field prevents it from, from moving. So you wind up with a situation that a very high inductance to a very high, uh, or let's say a, a very high uh, fluctuating electric source across an inductor might as well be across an uh, open circuit. So inductors and capacitors are exactly inverse to each other with respect to frequency. Resistors don't care, but resistors aren't interesting for Tesla coils at this moment. So what happens is when you're at, a, at the resonant frequency in either the input or the output circuit, and there's two, there's two resonant circuits, there's an input and an output. When you're at the resonant frequency, the energy, you have maximum energy transfer between the magnetic field in the inductor and the electric field in the capacitor. And those, that transfer of energy, magnetism, electricity, magnetism, and electricity, is just like a bell ringing. It is a certain frequency at which that wants to move. And if you hit that repeatedly at exactly that frequency, the voltages in that circuit are going to increase exponentially. In fact, if it wasn't for the resistance in the wires and, and, and other uh, dampening factors, it would increase without bound and blow itself up. And in fact, if you're building your own Tesla coil, you can create a situation where it blows itself up. And so you got to be careful about that. Um, now, there's two resonant circuits, and I showed you on the schematic. There's, there's a input to the primary circuit, and then there's, the, there's this piece right here. Now, you look at this and you go, where is the L and the C? Well, and then you can look at the primary down here and you can say, where is the L and the C in the primary? So, I showed you the, uh, the, the L in the primary circuit is formed by, by this uh, refrigeration uh, tubing. And there's one, two, three, four, five turns. And you can figure out what the inductance is that, uh, of that on a, uh, any of the programs online. And then this is the type of capacitor that would be down in the primary circuit. Uh, this is a uh, um, affectionately known as an M MMC, a multi-module capacitor. It's actually a whole bunch of capacitors put together in a nice little box that I made. Still have the I'm gonna use some uh, some uh, lucite, and I glued it together. And what you've got here are one, two, three, four, five. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I looked at this. So there's six strings of five capacitors in here. One, two, three, four, five. And each of these capacitors is 0.15 microfarad. And as you know, and you'll have to look this up online, but when you put capacitors in parallel, they add, but you put them in series. Uh, it's a strange calculation with um, um, one over one over the sum, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you can look this up. I believe Richie Burnett's website or... Uh, uh, there are a bunch of online Tesla websites that show you how to design these. In any case, the, uh, the overall effect of all of these capacitors is that 
it is uh, 0.18 microfarads. If you can see that, I actually wrote it down on here, uh, and, and it'll support 10 kilo, kilovolts. That's why I have five of these. Each of these capacitors can support two two kilovolts a piece. If I put ten of that, five of them in series, I can support ten kilovolts. Um, but I need to get 0.18 microfarads, so I had to put six of them together to make a capacitor, an equivalent capacitor that could handle 10 kilovolts at 0.18. So I put them together this way. It turns out that you want to size the capacitance to the, uh, when you're doing a static gap, you want the capacitor size uh, to relate to the current that's supplied by the neon sign transformer. And so um, I believe uh, one uh, 60 milliamp neon sign transformer, this is a good value for that. And uh, I used this in one of my static gap coils a long time ago. Uh, it's a nice little device. And these capacitors can be found online. They're very difficult. These are the, uh, the uh, heralded uh, uh, mythical 942C20s uh, that are used in, in Tesla coils all over the world. In fact, I don't know what else they're used for. I only know they're used for Tesla coils. Um, they're somewhat difficult to find. They used to be somewhat expensive. I used to buy grosses of these uh, five, six years ago. Um, you can still find them. Very good capacitor. They're self-healing, so if they actually, uh, they tend to not blow up. If they suffer a failure, they self-heal up to some degree. All right, getting back to this. So inside this box, if this were a static gap coil, which it once was a static gap coil. It isn't anymore. Now it's a DR coil. But there's a capacitor bank like this. Um, I've got uh, a way for power to come in to this box, comes in through the outside, I'll show you. And so there's a capacitor, there's a, there's a gap, and there's this coil. So C, and this is an L. So these had to be sized correctly for the resonant frequency I picked. Now what resonant frequency are you going to pick? All right. um, the resonant frequency you pick depends on the type of coil that you're going to build. And the type of coil you're going to build, uh, spark gap coils, it's almost irrelevant what resonant frequency you pick, you, because there are very few of the parts that are going to fail if the frequency is too high. Uh, as it turns out, for a DR coil, the resonant frequency you want should be somewhere in the, you know, depending on the devices you're using to drive it, uh, the devices that I used, around 60 kilohertz was probably a little high, uh, 40 kilohertz would have been better. I believe this coil is resonant at about uh, uh, 58, might be 48 kilohertz. Uh, okay, so I picked, this is not the capacitor array that I'm using in this right now, but it could be, it was in the past. So here's an array of capacitors, LC on the primary, F0 equals one over the square root of LC, you figure that out, you get a number. The secondary, which is this piece right here, has to be resonant at the same number. Now, as it turns out for DR coils, you want to have it be a little bit off, uh, but for the sake of the theory here, we'll say it has to be the same. So where's the L and the C here? Well, clearly this is an L, right? Clearly this is an inductor. Uh, lots and lots of turns of wire. Uh, it's a coil, it makes a magnetic field, it feels the magnetic field, that's the L. Where's the C? Because you need LC. Well, this is it right here. This is the capacitor. This makes the capacitor. Electric field builds up on this. That electric field is connected to the atmosphere, basically connected to the Earth. And so there's a capacitance associated with this. And so the geometry of this toroid is such that it creates a capacitance uh, with this L, or capacitance, or let me say, I'm saying that wrong. The geometry of this toroid is such that it creates a resonant frequency that when you take the value of the capacitor and the value of this inductor here, it's roughly the same as the value of this capacitor and the value of this inductor. Now, that seems somewhat complicated, and it is. And the good thing is you guys can go over to Java TC, and you can enter in all the values, and it, it takes a little figuring out, uh, but actually I think there's an online help and what you do is you, you enter in the geometries that you want. There's some rules, for instance, it's always a good idea that the secondary is no more than five times, five times taller than its diameter. Uh, this one here, I believe, is a, it's 
This might be eight inches. So eight inches, and so this is probably, that well, seems shorter than 40. Might be a six, this might be 36 inch. So this might be a six inch diameter coil, uh, 30 inch uh, length. And um, this toroid here, I believe, I don't know, four inches. I guess it's about a, uh, it's longer than a foot. This, I think this is a, a 14 by, so you measure a toroid this diameter, this big diameter, and then this, the minor diameter. And we could get a tape measure. I actually have them right here. So this is a 6 by 24. So 6 by 24 Toro. I actually got that online. Uh, these are not cheap. You can make them. And in fact, you might be uh, better off trying to make one. Probably cost you 20 bucks to make one. This costs several hundred dollars. Okay, to recap, C and L. The frequency you get from CNL here has to be the same as the frequency you get on your primary circuit down here. So the capacitor that, in my case, is down inside this box, and that. All right, moving on.